Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 116. Written by Pepper Antique. James and Vickers actually arrived at the capital at almost the exact same moment. In fact their timing, and the fact that they both came from through the city's southern region resulted in them arriving close enough that Vickers was able to see James, riding into the city. He'd landed Tom only a mile or so away from the outskirts of the capital's southern residential district, startling a vendor who was wheeling their cart towards the city a little bit. He smiled at the man and nodded, ignoring the vendor's scowl at being caught off guard, and began trotting Tom toward the city. As he approached he saw the group of travellers, the two drakes, the carriage with the werewolf on the coachman's seat, all riding together and chatting. He had the feeling that he was looking at something he should recognise, so he pulled his jacket open and looked at the tablet hanging inside of the left side of it. He tapped on it, bringing up his intelligence files and then pulled up Captain Choi's dossier. He still disliked that the young specialist had technically been promoted past him. But that was a problem for later, and preferably never. He looked through the file, reading up on the finer details, and eventually pulled up a photo that Choi had sent command of his drake. Then he looked back up at the riders only a hundred yards or so ahead of him. Then the picture. It was definitely Choi's drake. But what was this black armor he was wearing? Was that the princess sitting behind him, resting her head on his shoulder? If so, then lucky lucky specialist. He thought. Was that the prince riding next to him? The one that had attempted to exile him and learned the hard way what a point four five could do to a kneecap? Was that the werewolf that command had overheard Choi, and the king talking about handing over to command for interrogation about Sergeant Odiko's death? They hadn't told Choi that they'd listened in on that conversation even before Choi had accepted the call. But they had. They knew that the wolf was involved somehow. Why was Choi still working with them? All these thoughts and more ran through his head as he casually tailed the group in front of him from on Tom's back. James was completely unaware of the tail they'd accidentally picked up. But Keela's nose picked something up that she couldn't quite place. It was a familiar smell. Her brain recognized it as something that she'd scented before. But it just wasn't clicking into place. It didn't help that she was excited to be home. Excited not only to be back at the capital and the castle, but more importantly back where her family was. She fully intended to spend the night with Yale and the pups, and turn in for debriefing in the morning. But what was this smell? It had suddenly arrived out of nowhere, a gust of wind bringing it whipping across her nostrils unexpectedly. It came with the scent of sweat, and magic, and... Griffin! She looked over to where Amina was telling a story of one of her campaigns. But it was a campaign that Keela had been part of, so she wasn't really listening. Mostly she used the turn of head to peek out of the corner of her eye looking backwards. Sure enough there was a griffin riding a ways back. The rider was looking at something inside his jacket for a second. Then Keela had to turn back and laugh a bit at the story. When had that man gotten there? The griffin meant he could have come from anywhere. But he hadn't been there a few minutes earlier. Whoever he was, he was large. She could tell that even out of the thick coat he was wearing he would be a large muscular person. But the smell coming off of him was her main question. It smelled musty and sharp, with a hint of rotten egg. There was also some kind of chemical smell that came with it, almost like some of the solutions that Vilairi had in her lab at the castle. She sniffed deeply, focusing as much as she could. Where had she smelled that before? Despite the fact that Vickers had been checking his tablet at the time, entering a quick message about seeing Choi for command, he saw Keela check him out from the corner of his eye. So he covered by pulling out a piece of the salted beef from one of the packets in his jacket and began chewing on it. When the party came to a slight fork in the road, the sign pointing one way for the castle and the other way for the merchant square, he took the one they didn't. He paused for a second, as if considering which way to go, then headed right towards the merchant district. He saw, also out of the corner of his eye, the wolf look back at him for a moment. He'd have to be careful of that one. He knew where Choi and the others were headed. He could pick up their trail whenever he wanted to. But he needed to find a place to stay, and a place to keep Tom while he was here. Choi could wait until tomorrow.
After all, he had more than enough footage of the young captain and his group now. Besides, his primary goal was scouting the capital out. Keeler heard the man's griffin stop and peeked back at him for just a moment. He turned off down the other street, and even though it made the logical part of her mind relax, the wolf part told her that she was still being hunted, and that the hunter was simply fading into the woods to approach from a different angle. For all the trouble her wolf had caused her throughout her life, it had never been wrong when it came to sensing danger. And everything about that man was setting off warnings. Plus there was that smell. Yell and the pups might have to wait for a night. She thought. Artair told a crass joke. Something involving a gnome cobbler and a wine bottle. Amina scolded him, and Keela chuckled. When James and Amina got back to their room there were several letters and packages waiting for them. Most of them were for Amina, things for the princess and general to look over and approve or else accept as gift. However there were two letters and a small package for James as well. The first was a letter from Jixel, likely letting him know about Steve and Maxel's babies and what they'd ended up looking like. He set it aside for the morning. The other he didn't recognize. It had a small green seal on it that had an image that looked like a scale pressed into it. It had the small black paper wrapped package tied to it. It smelled like cinnamon and something else. Peppermint? Whatever it was it smelled wonderful to him, and he felt himself drawn to it. Amina was sifting through her deliveries as she undid her armor and filling the bathtub in her bathroom. She was talking about how nice it was to finally be home and in a real bed. He absently voiced agreements, mostly grunts, as his hand opened the sealed letter. The seal broke easily, though the edge of the envelope's tongue nicked his thumb with a paper cut. He pressed his thumb into his mouth and sucked on the small drop of blood that came off it as his other hand pulled the letter out. It was just a small rectangle of parchment that read. We would like to meet. And that was all. That's not ominous at all. He thought sarcastically. He pressed the letter to his nose and sniffed. The peppermint and cinnamon scent wasn't coming from the letter. He looked at the small black box curiously. Amina said something, but he wasn't really paying attention. Instead, he grabbed the piece of twine around the box and undid the knot. The box popped open as soon as the knot came undone, and James saw a small, round, dark stone inside. It looked like elemental obsidian. But it had a faint green shimmer to it, and when he looked he saw that the energy inside wasn't red like the fire elementals. Instead it was a dark bluish purple. He didn't notice the faintly glowing purple rune on the inside of the box's lid. He picked it up to take a closer look at it. The second he did his body fell back onto the bed, his eyes rolling back into his head, and his hand clutched tightly around the stone in a fist. Amina popped her head out of the bathroom to invite him in. But when she saw him on the bed she simply assumed that he had fallen asleep. Silly boy! She said to herself as she went back into the bathroom. He didn't even get his boots off. James couldn't tell what had just happened. One second he had been looking at something that had arrived in the mail while they'd been traveling. The next second he'd found himself immersed in complete darkness. He couldn't see anything. He couldn't even tell if his eyes were open. He reached up to touch them to find out. But his hands. Didn't. Exist? What the fuck? He thought. He flailed. Or at least he told his body to flail. But he felt nothing. His limbs didn't hit anything. But he also didn't feel the wind move on them. In fact he didn't feel them either. What the fuck? He wondered, panic beginning to rise in his mind. You are the summoned hero, Captain James Michael Choi. Said a voice. It wasn't a question, just a statement. It seemed to come from everywhere simultaneously. But it wasn't loud. Who the fuck are you? He meant to say the question. But instead it simply sounded within his mind. Despite that the speaker, or entity or whatever they were, still acknowledged it as though it had been spoken. We are the agency. It replied. The word agency hurt inside of his head, despite the fact that he couldn't feel that either. What the fuck is going on? Where am I? What do you want? He thought spoke back at it.
That is simple Captain Choi. The voice responded. We would like to have a conversation as to what your plans for this world are. That way we can determine whether or not you're actually a threat to our plans. Or simply a temporary obstacle. Wait. Your plans? You tried to kill Amina. He replied. Yes. It said coolly. Then we're enemies. He shot back. For your sake, you should really hope not Captain Choi. It said. When it said his name he felt a deep pain that reverberated throughout his entire body, as it were. Otherwise. It continued. This gets rather unpleasant for you. Now, let's begin our discussion.